and we will get started. All right, well, thank you all for being here today on this lovely Thursday before the storm and welcome. You are in TRPA 102 for Realtors and Consultants. This is a special webinar that we try to do every year. Uh, so Jeff, is hand, Jeff, our public information officer, is behind the scenes handling this screen. So Jeff, can you switch us to the next slide, please? Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Victoria Ortiz. I am the Community Engagement Manager for the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. Next slide, please, Jeff. And we're going to start with just some general webinar guidelines. So everyone is muted, as you can probably tell, and we're asking that you please use the Q&A box to submit questions. So if you do have a question throughout the presentation, just feel free to click on that Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and you should be able to ask a question there. Um, we do have quite a few people registered for this webinar, so we may be summarizing questions as we get them. Um, and just so you all know, the recording and the slides will be sent after the presentation. Next slide, please, Jeff. Great, thank you. So we wanted to start with a little bit about what we do. TRPA was the nation's first bi-state environmental planning agency, and we lead our region's effort to protect our spectacular environment while also supporting our communities to prosper economically. As realtors and consultants, you probably get the question of who is this TRPA and why do I have to work with them? So we wanted to provide just a little bit of historical context. Next slide, please. So much of the Tahoe Basin was built out between the 1950s and 70s to support the growing tourism industry. And as many of you know, in the 1960s, the Olympics put Tahoe on the map as a year round destination and rampant development took place. In fact, originally a city the size of San Francisco was envisioned in Lake Tahoe. So TRPA was created at this time when the states of California and Nevada came together and approved a bi-state compact to oversee development in Lake Tahoe. Congress ratified the agreement and TRPA was born in 1969. Today, urban development makes up about 10% of land use in the Lake Tahoe Basin. And although this may seem like a relatively small percentage, development has huge environmental impacts. By building on the sensitive areas that once acted as natural filters for water, such as the Upper Truckee Marsh on the South Shore, shown in the bottom left there, pollution now had a direct line to enter Lake Tahoe. And this led to decreased clarity and large algal blooms. Other older development is also a significant source of water pollution. In fact, 70% of the fine sediment that enters the lakes are from private properties, roadway, excuse me, roadways and asphalt parking areas. That's why it's so important that people install the BMPs or best management practices that Shay is gonna be talking about a little bit later. So TRPA works with myriad private and public partners in the basin to oversee land use and transportation in the basin. And we're a planning agency that's super unique in the United States because we have the authority around development that spans the entire watershed. So as a planning agency, we adopt plans and regulations for Tahoe to achieve and maintain the region's environmental goals, while at the same time providing opportunities for orderly growth and development. And this measured and responsible growth policy has been shown to preserve property values over time. So last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary virtually. Hopefully some of you donated to get a Tahoe coin. This initiative raised over a hundred grand for environmental education um, around the basin. And we know that 2020 was a banner year for real estate. So we wanted to take the opportunity to share updates on our end and answer any questions that you may have. Next slide, please, Jeff. So to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, we'll start with some online tools that hopefully you're already familiar with. Uh, give you some updates on permitting and housing, as well as BMP requirements, coverage exemptions, transfers, and some other TRPA updates. And for those who are just joining, I do want to mention again that the recording slides and all the web links in this presentation will be sent to all attendees after the presentation. Next slide, please. Great. So we're going to start with a poll. And I'm going to go ahead and launch that. Hopefully everyone can see it. 
Go ahead and answer if you attended TRPA 101 last year. So during last year's presentation, we did get some feedback that people wanted more details and less background. So we've modified this year's presentation accordingly. Um, if you do need more background, I recommend that you watch last year's presentation, which is can be found on our Vimeo channel. You can also go there to find more videos about tree removal permits, coverage, development rights, and more. So I'll give you just another 10 seconds here to vote if you haven't already. Excellent, good. Well, it looks like we have quite a few new folks. So thank you so much for joining. I'm going to end the polling right now, share these results so everyone can see. We have about 15% who attended last year and most people, 76% did not. So again, thanks for joining us today. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. So we'll start with a few online tools that can be really helpful for you starting with our new website. So last year we launched trpa.gov, uh, a redesign of our website that now features improved searchability, better functionality, intuitive navigation, which was based on public and private needs and a fresh new look and feel. So hopefully now it'll be a much easier for you to find links to applications, permits and to Lake Tahoe info. So we're asking that you please bookmark this new site, trpa.gov, and let us know what you think. Uh, you are one of our key partners, so we're also hoping that if you have any links on your website to the old trpa.org, that you can update it to point to trpa.gov. Also wanted to share, um, like many of you probably use all the time, we have the parcel tracker, which you can find at parcels.laketahoeinfo.org. This is a clearinghouse for information about properties within the Tahoe, Tahoe Basin. So that includes deed restrictions, land capability information, development rights associated with a parcel, and a summary of TRPA permit records. Next slide, please, Jeff. So we've got a little chart here that shows the phone messages that we received last year versus this year. And as you can see, everything's been going up. Uh, we know that you're busier than normal and so are we. So we know that time is of the essence when you're closing escrow. So we're doing our best to triage these unprecedented applications that we're receiving and being as efficient and streamlined as possible. We did wanna share that the process has now moved electronic and online. So we are reviewing, permitting and acknowledging permits um, electronically. And last year, most people submitted their their permits and applications electronically, which is great. We hope that trend continues. So if you have any questions for us along the way, there's kind of a, a format that we like to recommend. And we say, start by checking trpa.gov or Lake Tahoe info and see if you can find your answer there. If not, you're welcome to call our general line for current planning and someone will return that call within 24 to 72 hours. And you can see the phone number there, 775 588-4547, extension three. Um, we always have a planner on call that is responsible for returning phone calls. We do ask if your question is more than 20 minutes long or really complicated and nuanced, we recommend that you, you apply for a pre-application consultation. So you can do that by going to our website and there is a fee associated with that pre-application consultation. So generally for timing, our goal is to return phone calls within 24 to 72 hours. We'll do the initial review of an application within 30 days, and we wanna have that permit submitted or done within 120 days. But it's important to note that that 30 day clock doesn't happen until the permit is complete. So if we receive an incomplete permit, that does not start the clock until it's fully complete. We know that um, you all are busy and we're getting a lot go, a lot of uh, demand in our office. And so hopefully we are actually hiring a new planner in the next month to help with this increased demand. So at this point, um, we're going to stop and see if anyone has any questions. So it looks like if you have any questions, once again, you can put those into the Q&A box if you have any questions of what we've discussed so far. So I'll give it a, 
a second or two here to see if any questions come up. And generally what we're gonna do is after every person's section, we'll have time to look back through that Q&A box and see if we've gone through some of those questions. We'll leave about five minutes for that and then we'll move on to the next person. Um, so Mike, your question of where you find historical records on a specific parcel, uh, check out that Lake Tahoe info, the parcel tracker. Perfect, thanks Jeff. Parcels.laketahoeinfo.org. Any other questions? All right, then um, Jeff, you can move the screen along and we'll pass it to Karen Fink. Thanks V. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I'm Karen Fink, I'm the housing program manager for TRPA and I'm also managing the Tahoe Living Housing and Community Revitalization Initiative. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what that is um, coming up. Um, but I'm going to introduce some changes that TRPA is currently evaluating that are geared towards increasing the supply of workforce um, and local housing in the basin, which, as I know many of you are aware, is a really critical issue right now. As V was pointing out, the supply of homes is really dwindling. Um, so uh, these changes that we're looking at are consistent with TRPA's regional plan goals of providing sufficient workforce housing um, and supporting walkable neighborhoods. So you'll hear about that as we um, go through the slides. Um, I just want to quickly go over a little bit about what the Tahoe Living Housing and Community Revitalization is. Um, and uh, the governing board um, last year designated uh, the a Tahoe Living Housing and Community Revitalization Working Group to um, tackle some housing issues. And this group meets every few months. So th this group is actually a committee of the Advisory Planning Commission, and um, it includes the wide variety of stakeholders who are working in housing in the basin. And I'm sure that several, I know that several people who are on this um, call today also sit in on those meetings. And the meetings are totally open to the public. And I have a slide at the end that tells how you can get involved in them. So um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over two of the recommendations that this working group has put forward and that staff are currently evaluating. Um, and we're gonna also be bringing these recommendations forward to the Advisory Planning Commission and two governing board committees as informational items next month. Um, so the first recommendation is related to accessory dwelling units. And I'm sure most people here know what those are, but when we're talking about accessory dwelling units, we're talking about attached or detached units that are on the same parcel as an existing home. Um, and they can often be used to provide a, additional living space. Um, they're often used to rent out to local workers or local residents um, or to house a family member. And they can be used to provide additional income for the owner of the home, potentially helping um, a local resident um, offset their mortgage costs. Um, we also uh, show up here a junior accessory dwelling unit, which is actually a California designation. And those are units that are 500 square feet or less in our repurposed existing space. Um, so next slide, please. So um, currently TRPA's code does not allow accessory dwelling units on parcels of less than one acre in size. And we're finding that that restriction really doesn't support regional plan goals of walkability and of encouraging housing close to um, transit and town centers, because most of those parcels that are that large are, are you know, far from town centers and walkable neighborhoods. So um, the working group recommended lifting that one acre restriction um, so that accessory dwelling units would be allowed on any residential parcel. This would just be TRPA's code. Accessory dwelling units would still be subject to um, regulations at the local level. So each individual county or um, the city of South Lake Tahoe, they all have their own regulations related to accessory dwelling units, where they're allowed, the size, things like that. So those would um, also apply. Um, there's a few other elements of the recommendation that we're moving forward um, for feedback from the 
governing board committees next month related to um, lifting some of the noticing requirements that we currently have for accessory dwelling units and the number of units. Um, and if you're interested in those, I encourage you to look at the staff packets that will be posted um, at the beginning of June. So one other element of this proposal that we're bringing forward is that our um, TRPA's coverage and growth management requirements would still apply to accessory dwelling units. Um, next slide, please. So another code change um, that's part of the working group's recommendations that will be coming forward in June um, is related to non-conforming tourist density and how we can help use that density um, for housing when these um, projects undergo redevelopment. So we have quite a few older motels, uh, many of which are getting quite dilapidated here in Tahoe, and they don't have uh, water quality treatments in place. So the regional plan actually envisioned redevelopment of these properties into um, mixed use potentially with a residential component or just into residential projects, but currently our code disincentivizes that. So our current code allows all of these tourist units to be grandfathered in if they're converted to new tourist units, but not if they're converted to new residential units. So the working group recommended changing that. Um, so the code change that we're proposing would allow non-conforming tourist density to be converted and used for multifamily residential development on site. Um, and because allowing higher densities encourages smaller units, it increases the likelihood that through redevelopment, we would open up more units that are appropriately sized for workforce um, housing. So next slide, please. So here's a slide that lets you know how you can get involved in um, providing input on these code changes and other changes that the working group is going to be looking at. Um, these code changes that I summarized are going to be going forward to the local government and housing committee and the advisory planning commission on June 9th as informational items. So that's a great place to provide feedback. Uh, and the Regional Plan Implementation Committee will be hearing them as an informational item later in June. And then if you'd like to receive updates on when there's hearings related to housing um, and when the Tahoe Living Working Group is meeting, you can email me at kthink at trpa.gov and I will add you to our mailing list. So thank you. Thanks, Karen. Great presentation. We had a couple questions come in on the Q&A, so I will start with these. The first one from Jim is, will you allow extra coverage to accommodate ADUs? So currently, under this current proposal that the working group put forward, the focus was really on um, getting some changes in place that could allow the private market to provide workforce housing in the near term. So we did not, the working group did not come to consensus on any incentives related to coverage. Um, although they did recommend looking at that further down the road. So with this current proposal, um, ADUs need to, uh, they have to comply with the existing coverage for the site. So there's no additional coverage provided for ADUs. If there's enough coverage remaining on the site, then the um, owner could build a, de a detached ADU. Um, of course, there's also the ability to build an ADU over the garage or use repurposed space, which would not require additional coverage. Thank you. And then another question here is, will the ADU require a deed restriction for affordable or workforce housing? Under the proposal that we are moving forward, a deed restriction is not required. If the owner wants to, um, deed, is willing to deed restrict the property, they would receive a free bonus unit, um, a free development right, as long as that property is within the area where bonus units are allowed, which is currently about um, a one half mile from transit, and we're looking at expanding that slightly. So if the property will be deed restricted, then um, there's a benefit assigned to that, but it's not required. Thank you. And then there is one more question that does the additional ADU also apply to the Olympic Valley um, or is Olympic Valley even within TRPA jurisdiction? I do not believe that Olympic Valley is within TRPA jurisdiction and I would invite any of the other planners to chime in on that as well. 
Uh, this is uh, Matt Miller. The uh, Olympic Valley is not within TRPA jurisdiction. Great. Thank you all. Uh, let's see. We're going to take just another minute or two to answer some of these. So we have a question. How many ADU units would be permitted for each property? The current proposal, which as I mentioned, is going forward as an informational item, so we're still taking feedback on it. Um, the current proposal is to allow up to two ADUs per property. Great. And Melissa asked, what is the income limit if it is deed restricted? So the our, the if they're deed restricted, they would need to be deed restricted to our achievable income levels. And I would encourage people to go to our housing webpage on the TRPA website to see what that is. Um, it varies by county, but it's above 120%, which is generally considered moderate. So basically our achievable income limits are the income limit that is needed to afford the median priced house. So it's somewhat above moderate income. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, we're going to move on to the next one, but there are a couple more questions in the Q&A. So Karen, if you could take a look at those and respond to it, that'd be great. Um, you can find more information, as Karen mentioned, on our trpa.gov website and look under programs and housing, and that'll take you to the right area. So for now, we will move on to Shay. Thank you, Victoria. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Shay Navarro. I'm the Stormwater Program Manager, and I'm here to discuss TRPA's Stormwater Best Management Practice Requirements. Next slide. So best management practices, or BMPs, are measures put in place to protect the soil from erosion. This includes paving your driveway and to treat and infiltrate stormwater runoff generated by the property. Um, before impervious surfaces from development existed in the Tahoe area, things like roofs and roads, precipitation would naturally percolate through the soil instead of running off and carrying sediment and pollutants with it. So to mitigate the impacts of that development on Lake Tahoe's water quality, TRPA requires all developed properties to install and maintain BMPs for perpetuity, as well as to meet fire defensible space requirements. Um, at TRPA, these BMP requirements are triggered uh, anytime you come in for a permitted project, such as new construction, additions, rebuilds, um, also lakefront properties wanting to participate in one of the mooring lotteries, or properties wanting to use coverage exemptions, which Ali's gonna discuss in more detail following me. Um, also any property uh, that's deemed a priority or in a priority area for compliance. And once a property passes a final inspection, they receive a BMP certificate, which is documented in the parcel tracker. Thank you. One other important requirement to note for the real estate community, especially if you're representing a buyer, is the TRPA code requirement for properties to disclose their BMP status at the point of sale and the new deed holder submits a form to TRPA within 30 days of sale. Next slide. Uh, the BMP real estate disclosure form can be found at tahobmp.org in the lower left corner and it can be submitted electronically or printed and submitted in a variety of ways, including taking a photo of the signed copy and emailing it to bmp at trpa.org. So right now we're just gonna take a few minutes and V is gonna help set up a quick interactive poll asking um, everybody attending, how many of you were already familiar with TRPA's BMP disclosure requirements? Great. Hopefully that poll is up and people are seeing it. Oh, there we go. Yep. And then Perfect. after that, you know, asking if you were familiar, how many um, actually submitted the disclosure form? Know if the if the disclosure form was submitted for the last property that you closed on. Mm -hmm. 
Looks like we've got about 65% of people who have voted. So maybe we'll just give it another 10 seconds. All right, three, two, one. I'm gonna end polling and share the results. Okay, so it looks like, you know, a lot of people are familiar with this requirement, um, but less know if the form was actually submitted or not. Um, this is TRPA's only point of sale requirement, and it was the outcome of a negotiation during the 2012 regional plan update to disclose BMP status versus requiring BMP installation at the point of sale. So making sure these forms get submitted really helps us justify that the disclosure process is working should this topic become debated again in the future. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So to find out the BMP status of a property and, and uh, the other info that you need for the disclosure form, you can go to the parcel tracker at ltinfo.org and you can hit the view parcel details once you search the address or APN and BMP status is summarized below the parcel overview section. And uh, the BMP status, what it shows you is if the property is certified and if it is, you can directly print the certificate the certificate number and issue date are also shown, as well as if the certificate was ever updated following verification of maintenance. Source control certificates are for properties who are unable to meet TRPA's infiltration requirements due to features found on sites such as high groundwater or bedrock that make infiltration not feasible. And we've provided a list of site constraint definitions with the handouts um, provided with this presentation. So once those site constraints are verified by TRPA staff, then they are shown as special circumstances on the tracker. So just because nothing is reported here doesn't mean that there might not be a special circumstance. Um, it just shows if a special circumstance or site constraint has indeed been verified. Um, properties unable to meet the requirements on site may have an opportunity to participate in an, in an available regional or area wide treatment program. These are listed uh, here on the tracker and are also a question on the disclosure form. Um, KSAT refers to the mapped soil infiltration, which if less than one inch per hour is considered constrained. And if a property is not certified, it could show that they are under enforcement, which means TRPA has contacted them in writing, identifying them as a priority for BMP compliance. Right now, many of our uh, limited resources are focused on lakefront properties because of demand from wanting to participate in the mooring lotteries, but we also coordinate with local jurisdictions to identify priority watersheds and um, typically focus compliance on commercial and large multifamily properties, which generate higher pollutant loads compared to single family. Um, but if you should come across something you don't recognize or you're working with a client, client who wants more information on what is required, please call the BMP hotline, which is 775-589. 5202, or you can email bmp at trpa.gov for assistance. Okay, and so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and then we'll turn it over to Allie, who's going to be talking about coverage. Awesome. Thank you, Shay. Uh, we've gotten a few questions in here about area-wide BMP programs. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about some of those that are coming up? Okay, so i am got the Q&A open and it says, are the first one I see reg regarding area-wide is, are there any plans to do more area-wide BMPs since rock trenches on properties just become blocked by pine needles and such? The property owners are stuck redoing BMPs. It would seem area-wide BMPs would work much better. So the answer to this is area-wide um, is something we are pursuing where it's feasible. And that really depends on 
um, the location of the watershed that you're in. Some watersheds like um, neighborhoods in South Lake Tahoe are a lot flatter and larger and have the uh, available space to potentially put in um, regional treatment, which is you know, larger water quality uh, improvement projects that could accommodate both private property runoff and runoff from the right of way. But other locations like Incline Village are very steep and don't have great infiltration rates. And so the local jurisdictions there are having a hard time even infiltrating the runoff that's generated by the roadways, the public right of ways alone. And so um, places like that are focused more on individual BMPs. And it, it is time consuming because it's a, you know, a partnership between um, the local jurisdiction uh, and, you know, private properties to make that work. Um, so the next question I see is something about maintenance guidelines on our website, tahobmp.org. We do have a maintenance section and under the resources page, you can watch several videos on BMP maintenance that go through visually and show you their short few minute videos showing what maintenance, um, how you can do maintenance on different types of BMPs. And let's see, this is, uh, there's a question, is there a penalty if the form is not submitted? Um, there's there's language on the form about a potential penalty should BMPs not be submitted. My comment regarding if the form is not submitted is just that should this dis debate, which has come up more than once over the years, if BMPs should be required to be installed at the point of sale versus being disclosed at the point of sale, uh, that having those forms come in shows that this process is working and um, you know doesn't provide as much um, I guess um, it just it shows the disclosure process is is working so that you know there's less of a need to try to push for installation at the point of sale. Um, and then as far, there's a question about preferred vendors for the installation of BMPs. Again, on the resources page of um, tahobmp.org, we have a list of BMP professionals that have um, taken our contractors workshop um, that you can use as a resource for doing installation and maintenance of BMPs. Awesome, thanks Shay. I think we might move on to the next section and if you could just answer, I know Joan is also going through and answering some of these questions, uh, but if you could answer some of them via chat, then we might okay. move on to Ali. Wonderful, part. thank you. Great, thank you so much. All right, Ali, take it All away. Right. Well, hello everyone, I'm Ali Borowski. I'm a senior planner in the um, current planning division and I do a lot of customer service. So today we're going to be talking about coverage and coverage exemptions. So next slide. So essentially, I want to start with coverage and that's a big question here. So what is coverage? Coverage is really anything man modified on the ground. So in the um, definitions in the code, it says it doesn't allow water to flow through it or native vegetation to grow in it. So that's kind of our definition of what coverage is. So the obvious example would be a house would be considered coverage, deck would be considered coverage, paper patio, bocce ball court, parking areas. Um, also even something like a gravel patio um, would be considered coverage because it wouldn't allow native vegetation to grow in it. The only exception to gravel would be if it's required for your BMPs. So that's essentially what coverage is. So now we're going to go on to the next slide and talk about coverage exemptions. So the, lots of questions about these. Um, some properties are eligible for coverage exemptions. Um, so Coverage exemptions came about in 2012. TRPA adopted the new code of ordinances, and that's 
when these uh, exemptions came into effect. So it's only been about uh, you know nine years now. So a couple of things, the property must be high capability. So that means it has a Bailey score of four through seven or an IPES score of 726 or higher. Um, so IPES parcels would not need a site assessment. So IPES parcels, again, um, are properties that were vacant in 1987. So any home built after 1987 has this IPES score. Um, and then homes built prior to 1987 would need a site assessment to determine what the Bailey's classification is. And so again, you can check to see if a property has a site assessment completed on laketahoeinfo.org. And if you don't see that we have any information on a property, that means it probably does need a site assessment today. The other thing I just wanna mention is we have a MOU or memorandum of understanding with uh, a few of the local jurisdictions. Um, and so, that's El Dorado County, the city of South Lake Tahoe and Placer County. So El Dorado County and Placer County, they do site assessments too. So you wanna check with them to make sure um, one hasn't been done uh, along with checking laketahoeinfo.org. So one last thing about coverage exemptions from this slide is BMPs must be installed or installed, installed as part of the project. Um, so next slide. Another important thing about coverage exemptions and to be eligible for them is any legally existing excess coverage or what we call grandfathered in coverage must be fully mitigated. And in order to fully mitigate excess coverage, either need to remove and retire the coverage or pay those mitigation fees. So just to give a quick example, let's say your lot's 10,000 square feet it's allowed 30% coverage, so that would be 3,000 square feet. Um, but when you got your site assessment done, that property, let's say, has 5,000 square feet of coverage we verified as legally existing. So that essentially means, to do math pretty quick here, you have 2,000 square feet of grandfathered in coverage. So either retirement of that coverage or payment of mitigation fees. And in a county like or in, in, let's say, incline, it's $20 a square foot. So that's a lot of money for some people. And that's why sometimes these coverage exemptions are kind of out of the ballpark for some properties. So just to uh, know about that, that's important. And so in order to determine that, you take your existing coverage minus your base about allowable, and that will give you your excess coverage. And then that's the amount you'll need to mitigate. So. Now we'll talk about the types of coverage exemptions. Essentially, there's three. The first one here is non-permanent structures. So that would be a shed or greenhouse, for example. And so you can have potentially um, a non-permanent structure, a maximum exemption of 120 square feet or 2% 2 of the non-sensitive land. So a property that's 5,000 square feet, that's pretty common. 2% of that would be 100 square feet. So just to know it's either 120 square, square feet or 2%, whichever is um, less. So next slide, we talk about the next kind of coverage exemption and that's pervious coverage. So using pervious pavers instead of asphalt or concrete, you can get a 25% reduction in coverage. And so if you have a 400 square foot driveway 25% of that would be 100 square feet. 100 square feet could not count as coverage if you use these pervious pavers. The thing with the pervious pavers is it has to allow 75% of the water to infiltrate and you have to have manufacturer specifications that prove that it's gonna meet the 75% of water to infiltrate. So again, typically this is pervious pavers and you have to have those manufacturer specs that prove that it's 75% um, pervious. So we're now we're moving on to the last coverage exemption that is pervious decks. And so up to 5% of the non-sensitive land or up to 175 square feet, whichever is less, um, could be exempt from coverage. 
Uh, the first zero to 500 square feet is 100% exempt. And then from 500 to 750 square feet is a sliding scale. Um, and so it's based on a percentage of each 100 square feet additional. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is three to one height reduction. That's not necessarily a coverage exemption. All properties are eligible for this three to one height reduction. So um, every three feet up, you can go one foot out without creating coverage. So a lot of really steep properties um, may not be eligible for coverage exemptions because they're probably low capability, like a class one, two or three. But if they have a, a pretty high deck, they may be uh, eligible to actually add a higher deck. If, you know, let's say it's 12 feet up in the air, quick math here, you know, they could go out four feet. So that's my last uh, slide on coverage exemptions if we want to move on. So there's a really helpful packet on trpa.gov you go to the permitting tab under residential, it's called land coverage exemptions. Um, and you can do the worksheet and figure this out for every uh, property you're interested in. And so uh, many other local jur jurisdictions can review the TRPA or the permit. So I kind of talked about that a little bit before, that's that MOU or Memorandum of Understanding. So we have one with Placer County, uh, El Dorado County and the city of South Lake Tahoe. So you may be able to submit your application and um, with one of those jurisdictions and they'll issue your building permit and TRPA permit. So we also have a really helpful document on where to apply on our website um, that'll tell you where you can apply for your certain project. So I think that's it for my section. So I'm happy to answer some questions if any are popping up. Awesome, thanks so much, Ali. Uh, the first one that we have is how much does it cost for mitigation versus buying more coverage? Okay. Um, how much does it cost for mitigation versus buying more coverage? So a property has to be eligible to buy more coverage. Um, I'm just going to let you know a lot of the times properties aren't eligible to buy more coverage. Um, there's something in our code, in the TRPA Code of Ordinances, you can download it from our website. Chapter 30 has um, a chart that shows you when properties can add more coverage and it talks about max allowables. So a 5,000 square foot property is the one that typically it comes up the most. You know, base allowable may be 30% where that's 1,500 square feet, but max allowable is 1,800 square feet. So it's typically only that 5,000 square foot property that is, is eligible, but this is a little bit of a tricky question. Every property is a little different. So um, typically this is for IPES parcels when you can buy more coverage. Um, but if there's a specific property, obviously we're happy to get on the phone with you and talk about it. Um, Hey, Ali, if they yeah. if if they uh, buy more coverage and then and then construct it, then then there's mitigation again, right? So there's there's still mitigation on top of buying coverage if if it's possible. Is that right? No, well, not necessarily. So if you have excess coverage, you're not going to be eligible to buy more coverage. You'd be mitigating your excess coverage. If you still are eligible within that max allowable to by coverage, then there's no mitigation required with transferring of coverage to your property. But you wouldn't be eligible to transfer more coverage to your property if you're already over covered, AKA needing to pay mitigation fees. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move us to another question here. Kelly asks, are previous decks exempt on the sliding scale if there is a roof or structure over a portion of that deck that might create that coverage at a three to one reduction? So would the roof count? So yeah, in order to get deck exemptions, um, the deck would have to be not covered. It has to be pervious. So it has to allow water to flow directly through it for it to be eligible for the deck exemption. Um, but using that three to one height reduction, so let's say the deck's on one level and then the roof's 12 feet in the air, 
you know, you can use the three to one. And so there may be a portion of that deck that could be exempt using the pervious deck, but some portion may um, count as coverage if there's a roof over it. So it's a little bit of a puzzle, but you can see if it works for your deck and roof. Excellent, thank you. And then there's someone who wrote in, what about Washoe County? And I'm guessing it's in response to that many local jurisdictions can review the TRPA portion of the permit. Yep, so we, we used to have a MOU with Washoe County, um, but that is no longer at this time. We are working towards having another MOU with them. So at this time, if you're in Washoe County, you have to come to TRPA first and then go to Washoe County for your permits. Thank you. And we'll just do one more question here from Svetlana. How do you determine the value of the allowable coverage and how can you sell it? So yeah, it's market driven. The value is market driven. Um, the California Tall Conservancy and Nevada State Lands are what we call land banks. I always recommend starting with them for a telephone call to see what they're selling it for. Or on our website, we have the TDR marketplace, transfer of development rights. We don't actually manage it, we just host it. So it's kind of like a Craigslist. So you can see what other people are selling their um, coverage or other development rights for that could give you a good idea. Great, thanks, Ali. There are a few more questions for you in the Q&A, just so you can be responding to those afterwards. Okay, no problem. I'll go through those. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Allie. And we will jump over to Jen. Hi, good morning. I'm Jen Sell from the Long Range Planning Program Manager at TRPA. Um, looks like we still have about 200 participants. Thanks for hanging with us and joining us this morning. Let's go to the next slide. So I was gonna talk about uh, transfer specifically with coverage and development rights. And one of the last questions, Ali started talking about coverage transfer. So it was a good segue. Um, today's discussion is somewhat high level just for the sake of time. If you would like more information um, on land coverage, what development rights are, how to acquire these, or a deeper dive into transfer. A great resource is the Vimeo page that TRPA um, has with a bunch of videos on there, kind of 101 videos that V mentioned at the top of the presentation today. Um, also the TRPA website, uh, trpa.gov is a great source. Um, the applications themselves have a lot of great information. Um, and then transfer specific, um, if you're really going into a deep dive of kind of the regulations and what you can and can't do. Um, those are going to be found in um, chapter 30 and 50 through 52 of our code. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the, the first topic here about transfers is one to focus on land coverage. And we get this question a lot. Can I actually transfer land coverage to my property? Maybe I want to do that addition or add a deck to my property. As Ali was talking about in the last set of questions, um, any property in the basin cannot exceed the maximum that's within our code. And Allie referred to um, a table or a guide that's in our code. And we have a snapshot here on the screen. And what this is doing is, is showing for residential properties, here's the maximum that you can have. A lot of properties in the basin were developed during the 60s and 70s actually before land coverage regulations were put into place. So a lot of times you actually have a lot there to work with already and more than what would be allowed today. Um, so there are some circumstances where you can transfer in coverage, um, but it's not gonna be uh, widely accessible. So it's good to do some research there. The other um, thing to keep in mind, we do have incentives for larger percentages of land coverage for parcels that are within town centers. So those are the commercial cores, but some residential uses, um, and there's 13 town centers around the basin. Um, those parcels can receive up to 70% um, land coverage. So essentially you can have 70% of that parcel covered um, at any given time. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is a general rule of thumb, if you are eligible to transfer coverage, 
um, it has to transfer from an equal or more sensitive property. And this is the land capability um, that you've heard us reference throughout today's presentation. To find out what the land capability is on a parcel, the best place to go is laketahoeinfo.org and click on the parcel tracker. Um, for properties that are sensitive, so land capability one through three, these are highly restrictive on what you can do with coverage. So there's a good chance if you're in those land capabilities, you would not be able to transfer in coverage. And then the last here to keep in mind is it must be a part of the project. Um, so maybe you're thinking about that ad addition or deck um, and you are eligible to transfer coverage. You can't kind of preload um, and transfer coverage ahead of that project. It would be at the same time as your building permit. So let's go to the next slide. So you found out that you are able to um, transfer in coverage. Um, the steps would be, okay, let's see what's verified. Let's see what I have to work with and actually how much do I need to transfer in. Again, that's going to uh, laketahoeinfo.org. Um, the coverage that is coming from the sending parcel does need to be banked. That's a term that we use. And it just means that that coverage that was gonna be transferred is removed on um, that sending parcel and the parcel is restored with natural vegetation and, and things like that. Um, we also do require that the applicants receive a title report and a grant deed on both the sending parcel and the receiving parcel. That gives us a better understanding of the history of those properties as well as any interested parties because coverage and development rights, um, they're assets that are tied to properties. Um, so that's important. And then that would be a TRPA application um, that can be found on our website. Let's go to the next slide. So that was land coverage transfers. Now let's talk about development right transfers. And when we talk about development rights, we're talking about land use units that have to be acquired before property is developed um, or maybe remodeled with a different use. Um, so these are tourist accommodation units, residential units of use, and commercial floor area. Let's go to the next slide. So you can transfer um, all of the different land use, land use units that I just mentioned. You can also convert um, from one land use type to another. Again, here, a general rule of thumb is it has to be coming from a more sensitive property and going to a less sensitive property. It must be legally existing, so you do have to get a verification through TRPA to verify that unit is, is legal. Um, similar to uh, land coverage that Ali was talking about in the last set of questions, um, the value is set by the private market, um, so the value is not set by TRPA. Um, as a, a difference between land coverage transfers and development right transfers, development rights can be transferred at any time. So say, for example, someone has a property that they are selling and maybe there's some banked rights and they don't want to sell those rights with the property. They could actually transfer those off of the property at any time to maybe another property that they own or um, some other scenario. Um, so it doesn't have to be part of the project. Let's go to the next one. The steps here, similar to land coverage transfers, see what's been verified. What do I have to work with? That's going to laketahoeinfo.org. Um, the development rights need to be banked on the sending parcel. So again, removed so they're no longer in use and they're ready to be transferred. Um, same with coverage transfers. We do need that title report and grant deed. And then it's a TRPA application. Let's go to the next slide. One thing to keep in mind when in regards to transferring development rights around is that we do have incentives if you're transferring development rights to town centers or from really remote areas. And what can happen is you can get bonus units for that transfer. Um, and uh, you know, some circumstances, you can actually get up to five bonus units for every one unit when you transfer that development potential. And that's again, coming from sensitive or remote properties. And the amount of bonus units is dependent on the sensitivity of the land from which the development came, and then also the distance from the town center. 
And so these bonus units are held by uh, TRPA and we would distribute it through a project application. And so this could be, you know, big rewards for a potential project where maybe you transfer one unit and you end up with five or six. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Let's go to the next slide. So um, just a few FAQs that we do get quite a bit on development rights. Um, can I transfer develop, development rights outside of my jurisdiction or what's called the hydrologic resource area or the watershed? Um, and the answer is yes, absolutely. You can transfer development rights from South Lake Tahoe to Placer County and Washoe and Douglas and all around the lake. Um, it is a TRPA application, but you would not need the approval of the local jurisdiction. Let's go to the next slide. So another FAQ we get is, do I need to have an approved project before I can transfer development rights? And the answer is no, you can transfer anytime. Um, you know, another scenario of this is, you know, say there is a, a old kind of legacy property that has come up for sale. And there is, um, you know, potential to redevelop that and make it, um, you know, have, you know, maybe additional commercial floor area or additional um, residential units. As part of that, you know, selling of that property, you could actually preload um, the development rights there and get it ready um, so that it's more, um, you know, it's shovel ready um, for that future development. So that's an option. Let's go to the next slide. And I think this is the last FAQ that um, we wanted to share is, are there any bank development rights available? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, the California Tahoe Conservancy, Conservancy does have um, some uh, banked rights. I've heard recently that their supply is, is very low right now and it's um, in high demand. Um, but we do have uh, bank development rights reports um, that we can provide if you'd like to see where development rights are in the basin. And let's go to the next slide. Just to give you a feel of what we are aware of, what's out there sitting on public or private property um, is the banked inventory that we know about today. So right now there are 204 units um, out there in the in the private sector, um, you know, that are banked on properties. Whether or not those are actually available for sale um, is a to be determined. Um, but that's a snapshot of what we know about. So that is the end of the transfer section. Again, check out the TRPA website or the Vimeo page for more information. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we've got a few questions for you in the Q&A, so we'll go through a couple of those first before we move on. Um, the first question is, how do you accommodate ADUs? I'm guessing that's what the development rights. So that is something that is actually under develop and being discussed about. Um, Karen Fink is actually a much better um, person to speak to kind of what what the thinking is there and the discussions that the working group has been having around that. I don't know if Karen is still with us on the call. I'm here. Um, yeah, under the current proposal, accessory dwelling units do require a full development right, just like a single family home. So they could transfer in a residential unit of use or they could get a bonus unit or they could wait in line for an allocation and pair it with a potential residential unit of use. Great, thank you both. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. Can you explain the difference between square footage transfer and allocation and business development rights? Sure, absolutely. So there is essentially three main categories of development rights. It's commercial floor area, tourist accommodation units, and residential units of use. For a residential property, um, say that's a single family home, um, that would, they would need to acquire or already have on the property a full residential unit of use. Um, and that is, there's no square footage requirement. So you could have a, you know, an older 900 square foot um, Tahoe cabin that is one residential unit of use you could have a 3,000 square foot newer home, and that is one residential unit of use. 
a residential unit of use is comprised of a potential residential unit of use and an allocation. When a building is constructed, those combine and that form that, um, that full unit. Uh, for commercial floor area, it's just it's slightly calculated differently. And that's primarily because um, uh, commercial uses have different impacts as far as vehicle trips and, and things like that. So commercial is the only um, development right that is calculated by square footage. Excellent, thanks, Jen. Um, I did wanna also mention, I noticed that someone's had their hand raised for a long time. We're not using that function right now in our Zoom webinar, so you can lower your hand and just add your question into the Q&A. Um, and let's see, there's one more question here. What about the coverage needed to meet the fire department requirements for turnouts, et cetera? So coverage that is required for turnouts, um, we would first look at, do you have coverage that is available for you to use? Have you reached that maximum? There is, you know, again, there are some exemptions um, to obtain additional coverage on properties for health and public safety reasons. Those exemptions are outlined in our code of ordinance um, under chapter 30. And I recommend um, checking out that chapter for more information. Or if you do have a specific property in mind and you wanna hear more about what options could be for you or your client, um, please feel free to reach out to a TRPA staff planner and we can help you with that. Great, thank you. All right, um, Jen, there might be a couple more questions in the Q&A for you to respond to, but I'm gonna move us on to the last section here. And again, if you, I noticed some hands keep popping up and going down, we're not using that raise hand function. So just go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, so next slide, please, Jeff. Great, so we just wanted to share a few more updates that would be relevant for realtors and consultants here. We wanted to share that at our April governing board meeting, uh, they unanimously approved the regional transportation plan that calls for an interconnected transportation system to achieve climate change strategies, reduce congestion and better serve residents and visitors. There's also a Washoe Tahoe area plan under development and that is going to the governing board for action soon. This will guide the growth and development within Washoe County. And this area plan would replace the former community plans and plan area statements. We also wanted to mention that there is a sustainable recreation and tourism coalition that TRPA convened last year in response to the unprecedented demand um, and visitation and recreation pressures around Tahoe. So this is comprised of public land managers, visitors authorities, private recreation providers, and communications professionals who are all coordinating on shared messaging and priority actions. And we do have an e-news that shares the latest issues that are impacting public lands and tourism. And you can sign up for that by emailing Jen Self, who is just presenting. We also recently released our 2020 annual report that's available on our website, which again is trpa.gov. And some people ask, how well are we meeting our, threshold, our thresholds? And in order to answer this question more interactively, rather than reading through a thousand page document, TRPA created a new online dashboard to consistently measure um, and track progress on all of the threshold categories. So you can find that at thresholds.laketahoeinfo.org. And what we're seeing is that overall, basin-wide collaborations are delivering constant improvements, but certainly the increasing impacts of climate change are threatening the future environmental health of Lake Tahoe. For moorings, we wanted to give you the update that uh, the 2018 shoreline plan did allow for additional piers that we're registering and permitting as code allows. For, re for re mooring registration, all moorings, which includes buoys, boat lifts, and slips are required to be registered annually with TRPA as of 2019. So that includes paying registration and mitigation fees online at Lake Tahoe Info. And there's also a new mooring lottery. So there's 
1,486 new moorings that can be permitted to residential, which includes single family and homeowners association or HOA parcels over the next decade. And 15% of those moorings are allocated each year. There's also a new peer lottery. So TRPA will be accepting preliminary peer proposals on June 1st of 2021 through June 30th. And TRPA has 12 total new peer allocations available for 2021-22, which includes four single parcel peers and eight multiple parcel peer peers. It's a tongue twister. So allocations, my last little note here, we wanted to share that the governing board recently voted to distribute allocations to local jurisdictions for the next two years. And you can find more information about that on our website. So next slide, please. For all of these things, TRPA, um, we can, we'd love to add you to our e-newsletter if you're not already on there. In order to sign up for that, you can go to our website, again, trpa.gov to sign up. You can also subscribe to Tahoe In Depth. This is the regional environmental newspaper that comes out biannually. We have our next edition, which is looking great coming out um, the, in the beginning of June. So you'll see that hitting the streets shortly. It's also mailed out to every single resident in the Tahoe Basin. Uh, we recommend that you follow us on our TRPA social channels. So we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for Tahoe Agency or Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and you should find us. Last slide. Great, so this is just where we say thank you so much for joining us. Um, and a reminder that the recording slides and web links will be sent after the presentation. We're finishing a little bit early here, so we're happy to use this time to answer any questions. So go ahead and submit any additional questions that you might have in the Q&A, and we will put that, uh, we will throw that back to our excellent panelists. Thank you everyone for joining us. All right, Jennifer has a question. Can non-lakefront homes apply for a mooring? So Matt, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer that one. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Miller. I'm with the Mooring Permitting uh, Program and uh, uh, non-lakefront and um, actually the more specific term is non-literal uh, or littoral. Uh, parcels are, are not eligible, single family homes are not eligible to apply uh, for moorings. Um, those uh, mooring buoys do have to be uh, in front of a parcel with access to the lake. Um, so, um, you know, that does render uh, those non uh, lakefront parcels ineligible. Great. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. There's some nice comments coming in. Glad that you all found this helpful. Um, all right, we've got a question here. If I want to sell 500 square feet of extra allowable coverage, what's the number to call? So <clears throat> TRPA doesn't get involved in transactions of coverage and commodities. Um, so like, I was saying a little bit before, we have the TDR marketplace on our website where you can post that you're selling it, um, but you would do the transactions on your end and then um, then you would need to submit a transfer application with TRPA to officially transfer that 500 square feet of coverage from one property to the other. That's when TRPA would get involved with a uh, with selling of coverage is that transfer application. And you can find that application on our website at trpa.gov. Thanks, Sally. All right, um, Karen, this question is for you. What is the new proposed lot size for eligibility for ADU? Yeah, so the the lot size proposal that's in the proposal that we're uh, taking as an informational item next month to governing to the governing board committees is that there would be no lot size restriction on from TRPAs. And so any 
parcel that's zoned multi-family or single family would be eligible for an accessory dwelling unit. That said, local jurisdictions may have their own restrictions and Douglas County and Washoe County do have some parcel size restrictions. So um, you would also need to look into the um, regulations at the county level. Great, thanks Karen. Jennifer has a question, are there no moorings that are accessed from public access beaches or areas? So Matt, can you answer that one? Yes. Um, yeah, let me, I can be a little more clear on my previous uh, answer. So um, there, there are three uh, different types of uh, properties that are eligible for, for new moorings. Um, that's public agencies is one of those. Um, uh, the other is marinas and then residential. So those are the three different categories that are eligible for new moorings. For residential, it is um, it is single family homes that are on the lakefront or HOAs uh, that are on the lakefront. Um, as far as public access beaches or areas, you know, there's a potential that moorings can be in front of those areas, um, but that would be, uh, you know, the local jurisdiction or the public agency uh, getting a permit from TRPA for those moorings and then placing them out there and then you know, potentially they could be using them uh, for public access, uh, but that would not, those permits would not be issued directly to non uh, littoral or non lakefront owners. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. Our next question would be, um, Let's see, there's one question on how do we get attention on this? What has to happen? Can you add a little bit more to that question? I think since there's been a few other ones, I'm not sure what's being referred to there. And then um, Matt, you've got another question for you here of on the website. It says that the new mooring lottery has closed. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and answer that. I'm gonna try okay. to uh, bundle a few of these together. So. Um, as far as the website uh, regarding the new mooring lottery, uh, the new mooring lottery did close uh, on April 23rd. Um, so accepting applications for new moorings, that's buoys, boat lifts, and slips. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that the lottery for new piers will open on June 1st. So that, that's what's opening on June 1st is the application period for the pier lottery. Um, which is separate from uh, from moorings. Um, so that's that's a separate application process and that's June 1st through June 30th. Um, I'm just looking down the questions here. Uh, what is the maximum number of buoys that a lakefront is allowed to have? Uh, the new the uh, the new ordinances allow up to uh, two moorings for a single family parcel. Um, there are some situations that you'll see, especially as real estate agents, that a uh, certain number of moorings have been grandfathered in that might be more than that. Uh, but going forward, the maximum number of moorings uh, per single family parcel is two. Um, let me see here. Regarding moorings, could an easement holder apply for a mooring? Um, you know, that that's going to be a nuanced question, um, but typically the actual property that they own, the parcel um, has to uh, adjoin or abut the high water line of Lake Tahoe for them to be considered littoral. Um, an easement uh, access through another uh, property um, and a right to access through another property does not typically grant you that kind of uh, that kind of right, uh, but it is going to be a specific question to the situation. Um, so if you do want to reach out to us, uh, you can regarding that. Um, I think you've still got more questions, Matt. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking through them here. So just <laughs> I'm marking some, yeah, marking some of these done here. Um, okay, we have a motel and want two moorings. Can we apply if we don't have them yet? Uh, as I outline those three categories that more of properties that moorings are available for, um, uh, tourist accommodation uh, 
is not eligible for new mooring buoys. Um, but if uh, the, uh, the, the motel or the tourist accommodation uh, has a pier, they could be eligible for up to one uh, boat lift. Um, so there is an eligibility that allows a boat lift, uh, but there is no eligibility criteria that allows additional mooring buoys for uh, a tourist accommodation unit. Um, let's see here. Where would we find the pier lottery? Um, I think Jeff is going to uh, include a link uh, there. Um, Jeff, if you could include it, and I, I could add that as well. There's a uh, there's a link on our website to the information packet for applying uh, for a new peer, and we'll link that here in the chat. Um, who is the go-to for any buoy-related questions at a later date? That would be uh, myself. My name is Matt Miller. Um, I'm a senior, uh, senior environmental specialist here at TRPA, and you can email me at m miller at trpa.gov and our, my contact information is also available on the website great and then i think there's one more question for you at the end there thank you Matt. um is there a way to convert a buoy to a lift or a slip uh yes uh you can convert uh, a mooring buoy a legally existing mooring buoy to a lift or a slip on an existing pier um, or on a new pier um, that is done through a shore zone project application. Um, when you're converting a buoy to a boat lift or slip, um, there are some additional requirements you know, that have to be met for uh, scenic mitigation uh, for the, the, the mass, the visual mass of that, uh, of that lift. Uh, I do wanna clarify actually, uh, a buoy cannot be converted for a single family um, for a single family parcel into a slip. Uh, new slips are not allowed at uh, single family parcels. Great, thanks Matt. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions for you there. Well done. Um, we've got a question here about ADUs. So Karen, oh, looks like Karen, you're already typing one, but in reference to ADUs, will the TRPA have a stand on the number of such units on a lot as long as they are within the lot's allowable coverage. So I'll let you go ahead and answer that one live. Sure, the like, current proposal is to allow up to two ADUs per parcel. And then again, that would still be subject to the local jurisdictions regulations related to that too, so they could place further restrictions on the number or the type. For instance, um, the city of South Lake Tahoe, I believe allows one attached and one detached ADU per parcel. Great, thanks, Karen. Let's see, we've got another question here um, about IPE scores in Placer County. And I know, Jeff, it looks like you're typing an answer to that, but I wanted to see if Allie or anyone wanted to speak to um, if Placer County is planning to lower their IPE. I think Jeff wanted to answer it. Um, I'm doing my best in the chat, but it's, I, um, there is no movement on this right now. We looked for solutions for it for a while, um, but there wasn't anything really clear that came out like, oh, here's how we, here's how we can work with Placer County to fix this. So it's moved off of the front burner. I'll say that. It isn't that we're going to walk away from it, but at the same time, I think that some outreach to the local government committee or the governing board may be, a pro, may be the most appropriate way to, to try and raise this again. The strategic initiatives that are set by the board kind of make our work plan. And they're very, right now, they're very high level looking at regional solutions to forest health, sustainable recreation, um, uh, tra transportation, you know, uh, vehicle miles traveled reductions, things like that. Um, but the, you know, and the planners in the current planning department are just really, really busy keeping up with the permitting side of things. Even in the winter, there's no shoulder season here anymore. Um, but I know that this is a really important issue and, and we don't want to downplay it. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't anything that we were, that we, that we looked at and said, okay, you know, this one's going to be, you know, uh, uh, something that we can, that we can take on and solve. Um, but we're, it's, it's the same formula that's been around the basin. I know that um, we're aware that 
Lasser County was platted out and mapped out many, many, many years ago with some odd kind of parcel sizes that created some smaller sliver, sliver parcels that are in that pool that creates the ice line. This is a kind of a deep dive for folks that are, that, that are still on the call, but at the same time, um, changing that rule would, you know, it, it just needs to be looked at a little bit more deeply. Sorry if I'm not, <laughs> that is not the, uh, it's about the best I can do right now. Thanks, Jeff. Good luck putting that into the paragraph. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, Allie, did you have anything to add to that or are you feeling good? No, I think I think that's good. I mean, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have an answer. And I know we all want an answer, but um, we're just going to have to be patient. And um, it will, I assume, eventually happen. Um, but it's not on the front burner, like Jeff said, at this time. Great. Thank you. And I know we still have a couple phone in callers. So sometimes it can be difficult to ask your questions in the Q&A if you're on the phone. Um, Karen just shared with me that people on the phone can use their keypad um, for star six uh, if you need to ask a question via phone. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of the questions. We've got 77 answered in there if you want to take a look and make sure that you did see an answer to your question. Otherwise, we'll give you back 10 minutes of your day. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, hopefully we were able to answer some of your questions. We appreciate them and we look forward to working with you in the next year and beyond. Thank you to all of our panelists. And again, we will make sure that all of these slides are sent out to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.